1938, a British engineer's holiday was about to change the world. His name was Guy Callender. That year, he decided to take a break. But instead of relaxing, Callender had other ideas. He pursued his two, two great loves, bikes and meteorology. Calendar started collecting records from various weather stations, around 147 in total. And remember, this was before the computer, so all the calculations were done by hand. And what did he find? That global temperatures had been rising by around 0 0.3 degrees Celsius in 50 years. It was a landmark discovery. The only question left was why. Calendar blamed it on carbon dioxide. He said emissions from the industry were responsible. In hindsight, even emissions from his own beloved bikes. None of it mattered though, because in 1938, no one took him seriously. For starters, he was an engineer, not a scientist. So people said it's not his field of expertise. Also, the idea itself was too big to accept that human beings could alter the temperature of something so big, our planet. So Calendar's work was dismissed. Interestingly, he did not think that global warming was bad. He thought it was good. So how did we go from denying global warming to accepting it? How did we link it to greenhouse gases? Also, how did the whole greenhouse analogy came about? Time for a flashback. Where do you think the climate change timeline begins? The 19th century? Maybe the 20th century? Well, both answers are wrong. Even the ancient Greeks had an inkling about it. Like this man, Theophrastus. He was a disciple of Aristotle. Now, he did not have computers or fancy machines, so he simply observed. And what did he see? In the Thessaly region, temperatures cooled when the marshes were drained. In Philippi, when the forests were cut, it became warm. So Theophrastus joined the dots. Human actions led to climate change. He couldn't quantify or prove it, but he knew what was happening. Such localized climate change theories have been around for a long, long time. Some of them turned out to be fake. Like rain follows the plow. It was all the rage in the 19th century. People thought human settlement would lead to more rainfall. For example, assume there's a piece of arid land. It's all dry with no rain. Suddenly, people decide to settle there. They begin plowing the land to cultivate crops. In the 19th century, people thought this would lead to rainfall. Just stay in some place, plow the land, grow some crops, and rain would follow. Of course, it doesn't work like that. Such ideas were limited to certain regions. It was all localized. None of them thought global climate change was possible. That too by human action. But without knowing that, we were setting the stage for it. I'm talking about the industrial age. We built the steam engine. We built dozens of factories. All of it was done by burning coal. This became ground zero for climate change, for global warming. And when did we realize this? Well, it took a lot of time. In the 1820s, we took one major step forward. We understood the greenhouse effect. And it was proposed by this man, Joseph Fourier, a French physicist. And his logic was quite simple. Sunlight brings heat to the Earth. If the Earth reflected all of it back, it would be a cold wasteland. But the Earth is not a cold wasteland, meaning some of the heat is stored within. It is trapped. Now, Fourier said, the atmosphere is doing all of this. It is trapping some of the heat from the sun, which is exactly what a greenhouse does. Other scientists built on this theory. One of them was Eunice Newton Foote. She was an amateur scientist in the United States. In the 1850s, she conducted crucial experiments. Again, the concept was simple. She put mercury thermometers inside different glass cylinders. And what did she observe? The cylinders with carbon dioxide were hotter. So foot joined the dots. There was something about this gas, this carbon dioxide. It had the ability to make the air hotter. In 1856, her work was presented at the AAAS, the American Association for Advancement of Science. But guess who presented it? Not foot, but her male colleague. Welcome to the 19th century. Foot's work was largely ignored during her lifetime. It was only recently that she's been acknowledged. Three years after Foote's paper, another one was published, this time by John Tyndall. 
an Irish physicist. Now, if you're in school right now, you may recognize this name, John Tyndall, especially from the Tyndall effect. But don't worry, we will not go into that. We are focusing on his climate change experiments. Tyndall refined what Eunice Foote found. He proved the greenhouse effect, that gases like carbon dioxide could absorb heat. That's what he proved. His paper credits another scientist named Matthias Pouye, but it doesn't mention Foote. Maybe he did not know about her work. Or maybe he thought it was not relevant. Either way, by the late 1800s, scientists knew a couple of things. The greenhouse effect was real, and gases like carbon dioxide could trap more heat. Just one problem, though. No one looked at the larger picture. No one applied these findings to our planet's temperature. It finally happened in the year 1895, thanks to a Swedish chemist, Svantai Arrhenius. He wasn't actually studying global warming. He was studying the opposite. He was looking at global cooling. Arrhenius was trying to explain the ice ages. What would have caused it? He zeroed it on carbon dioxide. First, he gathered data on global temperatures. Then he began calculations. And guess how many? Between 10,000 and 100,000. That's how many calculations it took Arrhenius. One year later, in 1896, he published his paper. And the takeaway was simple. If CO2 levels were halved, temperatures would fall by 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. So lesser the CO2, lesser the temperature. It was job done for Arrhenius, but soon he started wondering, what if the opposite happened? What if CO2 levels doubled instead of halving? Then temperatures would rise by 5 to 6 degrees. Not many people bought it, especially after hearing his next claim. Arrhenius linked CO2 levels to the burning of coal. He said CO2 levels would increase by 50% in 3,000 years. I guess he was wrong. Not about coal, but about the speed. Because in the 20th century alone, CO2 levels increased by 30%. Anyway, Arrhenius went on to win the Nobel Prize, not for climate change though. That part of his work was always polarizing. His theory was finally proven in 1938. It was too late by then. Arrhenius died nine years before Guy Callender's experiment. So let's recap again. By the 1940s, scientists knew three things. Greenhouse effect was real. Carbon dioxide was among the main culprits, and coal burning would lead to global warming. Again, just one problem. No one thought it was an issue. Not Guy Callender, not Swante Arrhenius, and not John Tyndall. They all thought it was great for the world. The cold, uninhabitable places would get warm. No fears of another ice age. Also, more agriculture in higher latitudes. What's not to like? It would take decades to change that attitude. In fact, forget global warming. In the 1970s, some scientists were worried about global cooling. In 1974, the Time magazine carried this article, another ice age, question mark. It was mostly because of aerosol pollutants. These could block and reflect the sunlight. And after World War II, these pollutants were everywhere. So global temperatures did fall from 1940 to 1970, but this was temporary. By the late 1970s, the cooling stopped. The Earth was now on a highway to warming. And when did we realize that this was a bad thing? Many scientists point to the year 1988. That summer was the hottest on record. We had wildfires, droughts, and all kinds of climate events. So politicians took notice. The same year, a NASA scientist gave an alarming warning. His name was James Hansen. He said he was 99% sure that global warming was upon us. That's when things went into overdrive. In 1989, the IPCC was formed, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Its job was to study the evidence, to see how bad things were. And by now, computers were more common, so temperature calculations were easier. Scientists predicted multiple climate disasters, like droughts, wildfires, and powerful hurricanes. They also began talking about sea levels. As polar ice melts, more water would be added to the sea. More water equals rising sea levels. Studies claimed the seas could rise by up to 98 centimetres by the year 2100. It was a proper SOS. Governments realised they had to act. Like nuclear weapons and global peace, climate change became an international issue. So in 1995, the first COP was held, the Conference of Parties, the annual climate summit. 
Two years later came the Kyoto Protocol. It was the first global agreement to cut emissions. 41 countries signed the Kyoto Protocol. The target was to cut emissions below the 1990 level. A second agreement was signed in 2015, the Paris Climate Deal. This time, 197 countries signed on. They agreed to voluntarily cut emissions, but unfortunately, both deals have proved inadequate. Today, climate change is a proven science. But tell that to our politicians. Many of them still ignore it. Some of them downright deny it. But you see, climate change denial is not like saying that the Earth is flat or that the moon landing did not happen. It's not just another conspiracy theory. It's an existential threat to humans. The ancient Greeks had inklings about it. 19th century scientists made assumptions about it. And 20th century experts proved it. The question is, can 21st century politicians do their part?